We're going to continue uh, looking here at some aspects of textual criticism. Uh, so we'll continue our discussion here, first of all, uh, by looking at something about the styles of handwriting that was used uh, by scribes. Uh, so basically, we divide up the styles under two large categories. One is what's called the unseal. Uh, and so the unseal style is primarily written for formal literature. And so we have stiff capital letters. So, you know, the uh, New Testament particularly were uh, written in all capital uh, letters. And um, they're, they are unconnected, and there is no spacing between words. So you can see in this uh, one a photograph that I have of a manuscript that this kind of represents the unseal style. You can see that there are no, no spaces uh, in between words. Uh, there's no kind of paragraph, uh, but uh, words, words and ideas and concepts just flow one after the other. So this is the, the, what's known as the unseal style. Uh, and so this was the dominant style uh, for copying the New Testament uh, right up until about the 10th century. Uh, then there is the minuscule, uh, minuscule style of writing, and this is for more uh, kind of uh, form, informal occasions, uh, and so this will have smaller uh, writings um, and uh, small letter type styles. And so this was the dominant style of writing from the uh, 10th century on. Uh, and the earliest um, minuscule manuscripts is of the Gospels, and it's dated around 8... Um, 835 uh, AD. So almost nine-tenths of the existing New Testament Greek uh, manuscripts are written in the minuscule style. And so um, this is the, the most common. So if you're looking at the majority of our manuscripts, it's going to be uh, in this style, and though the earlier one is the unsealed style. So some things about other things about textual criticism. I'll we'll talk briefly about some abbreviations. So very oftentimes scribes would abbreviate words. Uh, sometimes uh, they uh, use a thing that we call contraction, and so sometimes we will see this taking place uh, over what's known as uh, nomina sacra or these sacred words. So for instance, you'll see a contraction uh, where maybe just the theta is used for representing God, or the kappa, like the K, is used that represents kurios, which is the word for, for Lord, or the upsilon, which will be written, and it's, you know, standing for quios, which is a son, or the key, well, it will be written, which is uh, shortened then for Christos. Um, you may even have an abbreviation of a word like soter, meaning uh, savior. Um, and so on and on, if certain words are considered kind of sacred or holy words, they might actually contract them, shorten them, and people can then kind of know this is, uh, this letter by itself uh, is referring to that word. So it's kind of a, a space-saving uh, technique, and it's uh, occurring uh, with these sacred words. Uh, sometimes there will be uh, suspension, so this is the use of only the first letter of a word or leaving off letters, uh, but substituting a horizontal line above the last letter. Uh, so, uh, for instance, again, like with uh, huios, um, and so um, that's if it has a, like a line over it, then again, this is kind of an abbreviation, or or this letter is um, lifted up, as it were. So the use of only only the first letter, leaving off letters, uh, substituting a horizontal line above the last letter, um, and um, telos uh, could be another one. Uh, so there are important uh, languages that uh, were used in copying. Um, uh, New Testament manuscripts. So we have lots of manuscripts that are written in Latin and Syriac and in Coptic and Armenian and Georgian. 
texts in uh, Ethiopic, and Gothic, and Arabic. Uh, so when textual critics are at work, uh, while there's certainly oftentimes a preference for uh, Greek text, it's, um, you know, would not be uncommon for them to make comparisons to texts that are written in other languages uh, and what those other languages might indicate about the Greek text that had been utilized or is the basis for these uh, translations. Now, uh, I am not aware of any uh, New Testament passage uh, that would be considered an original reading that is based off of solely a Latin or Syriac or Coptic Armenian text. Uh, and so none of these other translations, the Greek text, um, would be used to argue for an original Greek text that we no longer have. Uh, so I'm not aware of, of any translations that is being used in that kind of significant way. But in order to give credibility to an early reading um, in a critical apparatus, um, certain Latin, Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, or, or Ethiopic texts might be cited to lend support uh, that such a reading was known um, by others and translated into other languages. So uh, sometimes the question is asked, well, why did changes occur in the biblical text? So wh why did scribes make these changes? You know, weren't these... Um, you know, the copying of biblical texts, weren't they somehow or another kind of preserved from uh, errors or changes? And that's not the case. Um, the, there certainly were unintentional changes because these are human beings who, uh, who are copying these sacred texts and trying to do the very best that they can. But sometimes there were things that happened. Sometimes there were just errors of, of sight. So sometimes there can be uh, wrong uh, divisions of words. And I'm going to give uh, here some references that you can go back and look at and sometimes your, um, uh, your biblical translators uh, will provide you a note, and in the note they will tell you uh, sometimes the other options uh, that, was, uh, that have been used, and so how these manuscripts then, kind of these traditions began to develop after some kind of error had been made. So we have here kind of divisions of words because, you know, if all there are no punctuations and everything's capitalized, sometimes an author might think they're looking at one particular word because of the letter sequencing, whereas another scribe sees the letter sequencing and sees a different word. So sometimes there's uh, errors that are done by that. Sometimes there's just a kind of confusion of one letter uh, for another. Now I have here... Uh, an example from 1 Timothy 3.16, this is quite an interesting one, um, pretty significant one, because uh, you have in this uh, situation uh, a theta, so, um, uh, and uh, this theta um, is made with, you know, it looks like an, an obincron, it looks like a, an O, uh, but then with a kind of a mark through the middle of it. Well, um, uh, a Omicron Sigma, or you may want to transliterate into a, like an, an OS, uh, that is host, meaning whoever or whom. But if it's seen as a Theta S, uh, or Theta Sigma, um, then a scribe might think that that's a contraction and think that the author is talking about God. God can be represented as a theta sigma. So in 1 Timothy 3.16, it may be uh, indicating uh, that the scribe thought it should be theos that is there, uh, rather than hos. And be because of that, then you get a big change where 1 Timothy 3.16 may look up, talk about God manifested uh, rather than who was manifested. So, in other words, it's 1 Timothy 3.16 evidence of, you know, Paul or whoever wrote the hymn um, believed that Jesus was God who was manifest in flesh, as opposed to just um, 
Christ being manifested uh, in the flesh and not claiming Christ as God. So it has a big kind of theological issue. And so there was a confusion uh, of a letter uh, with that. And so that may have been an unintentional change that, that took place. Uh, what's sometimes called as homeopeluthon is where uh, an error can be made because there are similar endings uh, in a line. And so uh, sometimes an author uh, or a scribe, as they're reading, they may skip a line because there are similar endings between one line and another. So uh, as they look and they see the ending, uh, they think they're at one place in the, in the copy. And so they can sometimes leave out um, a line, uh, several words, uh, uh, because their eye has basically moved from one ending of a line to another one. Uh, or uh, there's sometimes this um, occasion of haplography, which is kind of a single writing, or dittography, twice writing. So sometimes a scribe ends up writing something once um, that should have been twice, or sometimes writing something twice uh, that should have only been written once. And 1 Thessalonians 2 7 is an illustration of this. Sometimes there's errors of etaticism. So we have here in, in 1. Um, uh, John 1, 4, um, and so um, with the catechism, uh, so just going back here uh, where I was at with the areas of the So with the catechism, this is basically where a vowels um, can become confused, and so if there is a, a situation in which uh, a word um, may have been written with uh, two vowels right next to each other, uh, and then one of those vowels uh, is left off, then that would be an occasion, or they can be, primarily it's when it's left off uh, that the uh, word changes, uh, and therefore um, they see a different word. The next scribe then will see a different word that is there than the one that the previous scribe uh, had seen. So that's an error of tat, uh, eticism. Uh, there are sometimes errors of memory. So sometimes a scribe is copying something, and when the, uh, the, the scribe has remembered a passage incorrectly, and they're writing down what it is that they remember as opposed to what it is that they're actually looking at, the, what would have been in front of them. And so they copy things down uh, that are not the words that were for them, but how they remember the, the passage. So errors of memory. Uh, sometimes there's just kind of errors uh, of judgment uh, that are made, where the um, author uh, th thinks that the scribe uh, has made a mistake, and so they're trying to then kind of correct um, what the scribe the previous scribe had done. So I have this uh, example from John's Gospel, John 5, 3 through 4, uh, where it's thought, it's talk, trying to make an explanation as to why the man who needs help to get down in order to get healing and this kind of stirring of the waters. And so the uh, what may have happened is some scribe had written on the side an explanation of why the man needed help to get into the water. And then the next scribe sees that information written on the side, which was like maybe some kind of note to explain things, but thought that it was information that should have been in there and that the scribe had left it out and had put it on the side because they had left it out. So they make a judgment to put it into the text. So those are... Uh, examples of errors of judgment. And sometimes there are intentional uh, changes. Uh, there are sometimes uh, grammatical or linguistic changes when um, someone, a scribe, sees something and they think that's not good Greek uh, and therefore wants to make a change to how something is read so it's read smoother or made more uh, clear. Uh, sometimes they're trying to eliminate apparent discrepancies if there is something. So in the Mark 1-2 passage, 
uh, you know, you have this reference to about the prophet Isaiah, but then you, you get other things besides the prophet Isaiah that is mentioned. So instead of calling it just the prophet Isaiah, it's the prophets. So that way you don't have a discrepancy that the thing that follows is not just from uh, Isaiah. So uh, sometimes the scribe will attempt to correct the text. Uh, sometimes there's harmonization. Um, and you will see this a lot of times, especially in gospels, where um, a text might be known in one biblical text. And so when they're copying a different gospel, they want the words that are attributed to Jesus uh, to be you know, identical to those words as they may appear in a different uh, gospel. So that would be harmonization. Uh, sometimes there's kind of conflation. And so by this is where a scribe may be aware of different readings of a particular text and not wanting to make a decision as to which text uh, is the preferred reading. They conflate, or they bring together the two different readings so that um, both are preserved in their copy of the text. Uh, sometimes correcting uh, presumed manuscript evidence. So I have an illustration here from um, Revelation 1.5 and um, has to do uh, with, you know, what is uh, considered um, the, whether or not the text has to do with blood or not. And so the author thinking about um, whether uh, there is some kind of atonement idea in Revelation 1 4, uh, or there is another concept that should be uh, expressed in the passage. So sometimes what they, th uh, they think was a, an error in the text, they'll correct it. Sometimes there are doctrinal uh, changes uh, that are made. Uh, and um, so lots of different intentions. So I'm going to end here with just looking briefly at some of the major text types. Uh, so we, what text critics do is they kind of see all these varieties of manuscripts and they categorize them in groups. So one group is called the Alexandrian text. Uh, and this is generally thought of as the most reliable single text. Uh, and it has the characteristics of being very brief. It's uh, self-disciplined. And so the examples that we have is um, Codex uh, Vaticanus uh, and Codex uh, Sinaiticus. So two of the very important codexes um, for, uh, uh, for looking at what may have been the original uh, text. Then there are what's known as the Western texts. These were used wise, widely in Italy, in Gaul, in North Africa. So it's characteristically uh, is fond of paraphrasing. So these scribes tend to paraphrase text. They changed words, they changed clauses, they even changed whole sentences. So I have a few uh, illustrations of what, uh, or a few examples here of what uh, those types of, uh, those codexes that would have fit into the Western text type. And then finally, uh, we have the uh, Caesarean text. Uh, this seems to have risen in Egypt. Uh, of course, um, it's interesting that it arisen in Israel, but it was brought to Caesarea um, um, in uh, Palestine, in the area of Palestine, where it was used by uh, Eusebius. Uh, it was characterized by a very distinctive mixture of Western and Alexandrian readings, and it had a preference for elegance of expression, so making sure that the text sounded elegant as a, as a piece of literature. Then there's the Byzantine text. These are This is the latest of the text. And so it's characteristically lucid. It's complete. It smooths away any kind of harshness of language. Um, it, um, but it also has conflating problems and harmonizing of readings. So this is where the the biblical texts is tend to try to provide a kind of a, a united front uh, with the uh, materials that are inside of the, the text themselves. So making words of Jesus all sound the same, no matter what gospel you're, you're reading from, or harmonizing language that might be in Paul's uh, writing so that they are 
similar in, in thought and sound. So that gives you a kind of a, again, some more information about the things that are going on with textual criticism. And so we'll uh, leave the review of text criticism there.